Good morning, Willingdon Church. It's good to see you all. And uh, we're going to worship today, but before we do that, I'm just going to read a passage from 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So let us think of that today as we worship the Lord, so let's all stand together and praise him.
talks about God's promises and His faithfulness that endures forever. So we invite you to sing along. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises.
we are singing to and singing about a God who keeps his promises. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He can be trusted. While we were still sinners, he still sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, to make a way for us to be reconciled with him. This is a God who is so grand, so holy, so almighty, and yet he was mindful of us. Would you put your trust in him today? Would you praise him for how he has been faithful with everything that he has given us? May we give that back to him in praise and in worship. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you. Oh, it's your breath, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out you to just take a moment and think about that as we hear this hymn being played holy 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 think about who God is what he has done and who he says you are who I am that he would invite us to be adopted into his family to be part of the beautiful kingdom let us worship and reflect on that and give thanks for that.
you are holy. And Lord, would you just ask that you would align our hearts with yours. Make us more like you. God, what brings joy to your heart, bring joy to our heart. God, what breaks your heart, break our heart. God, we want to, we want to live our lives as you would. So Father, transform us as we open your word today. God, speak, God, move. Open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to understand. We just thank you so much for this time and praise you for all you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. Well, welcome here to Willingdon Church. My name is Ashley and I serve on the worship arts ministry here. Extra special warm welcome to those of you who are new here, if it's your first time, or if you just happen to stumble in our church doors this morning, we're so glad you're here. No matter what age, what background you are, even what beliefs you have, you're welcome here. We're glad that you're here and we um, encourage you to explore and get to know the people around you. I want to point your attention to the four cards in front of you in the seat backs. You'll notice four in these colors. I am going to draw attention to two specific ones. So first is our Connect card, the orange one. The Connect card is for those of you who are new here or maybe you haven't gotten plugged into our church yet. We encourage you to fill that out and you can drop it off at the Welcome Center just outside these doors. And I just want to take a moment to thank you for those of you who have um, supported our ministries and have given financially. You allow our ministries to happen here. You allow us to share the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done in our lives and yeah, just the good the work that he's doing. So thank you so much. If you do call this your home church, we invite you to fill out the offering card. That's the purple card in front of you. You can fill that out, drop it off in the resource center just outside the doors as well. Or there's also online giving options too. It is my extreme pleasure to announce the Christmas production. All you know that's happening. How many of you are excited for that? <laughs> yeah, we are stoked. As you can see, we are getting the stage ready. Our stage is usually not this high or big, <laughs> but we're, we're prepping for that. So we're super excited and we hope to see you there. Today is the first day that tickets are available to you for purchase. Head upstairs just outside the doors up to the balcony and you can buy your tickets there. Tickets are $10. We have five shows and we have four dessert nights. So you can also buy dessert tickets up there. Those are $5. Dessert night is for all the evening shows, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So not the Saturday matinee at 3 p.m. We accept cash, credit, debit, check, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, you can go ahead and go upstairs after the service, not right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're excited to see you there. We found it a good opportunity to invite people who don't normally attend church or just invite your friends for a fun Christmas activity and get together to do but this morning, uh, Pastor Vin is going to be preaching on Matthew 18, verse 1 to 14. So right now, we just encourage you to take out your Bibles, take out your phone Bible apps, and we'll turn to it together. If you're able, would you stand with me in the reading of God's word? Matthew 18, verse 1 to 14. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown in the hell of fire. 
See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than, more than the ninety-nine that, ever, that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Nigel, as well. Because my arms can't carry this pulpit, so... Um, before we begin, uh, I want to pray for some of the circumstances that are a very short prayer from, uh, for what's going on in the world. I've sort of mashed together some prayers from the common book of prayer. So would you pray with me as we pray in regards to what's happening in our world today? So let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Would you guide the nations of the world into the way of justice and truth and establish among them that peace which is the fruit of righteousness, that they may become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus, you have commanded us to love our enemies. Lead them and us from prejudice to truth. Deliver them and us from hatred, cruelty, and revenge. And in your good time, enable us all to stand reconciled before you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, For those who don't know me, my name's uh, Vin. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, Before we continue, another announcement for our church family is that uh, this coming Saturday, November 18th at 2 p.m., we will have Bob Davies Memorial Service here at Willingdon Church next week. So that's Saturday, Bob Davies Memorial, uh, November 18th at 2 p.m. here at Willingdon Church. For those who know him, he served as an elder here. He served all across our church, and so he's uh, dearly loved and dearly missed as well. Uh, So as a church family, we uh, mourn with uh, uh, Davy's family, so please, yeah, would you join me and others next week? But as we continue, we're gonna continue in, in the preaching of God's word, in, the, in, in worship, by, in diving uh, deep, so keep your Bibles open to Matthew 18 as we you know, wrestle through uh, with what Jesus is talking about. I'm gonna start off by asking you a question. So the question is, have you ever been to or witnessed a game of little league soccer, or peewee soccer, whatever you want to call it. You know the little league soccer where kids play, where, where, where the beautiful game turns into something else. You know the, the game where the kids play, there's no formation, all the kids are just running around in circles chasing the ball, that's all they're doing. There's no real offense, there's no real defense. There's not even need for a coach, but yet there's a coach there screaming at the kids to do stuff. But the interesting thing with Little League Soccer is that when someone does score in Little League Soccer, they all cheer together. And when they win, they all sort of all win together. But things change when you get older. For instance, in professional soccer, We focus on teams, right? But we not only focus on the team, we focus on the superstar that is on that team. You know the one player that the team has who who, who makes that one team great? The one player we celebrate when the team wins, but the same player we blame when the team loses. So is that greatness? In many ways, Little League Soccer is actually more beautiful. Why? Because it's more, it's innocent. And there's a sense of humility in its beginnings. Today's passage, Jesus will help all who hear him, like understand true greatness, but also true humility. So I have three points I wanna make from today's passage, and they are these. First is Jesus' affection towards little ones. 
So the second is Jesus' action towards humanity's greatness. And then third, Jesus' attitude towards godly humility. So let me repeat that. Jesus' affection towards little ones, Jesus' action towards humanity's greatness, and then finally, Jesus' attitude towards godly humility. Okay, so the story recorded here in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 14, is also mentioned in two other Gospels. It's also mentioned in Mark chapter 9 and also Luke chapter 9. And each account adds like details that are very interesting to this one story. Okay, so last week, Pastor Brody preached on Matthew 17. He talked about God's power, God's plan, and God's provision. The week before that, Pastor Ray preached on the transfiguration of Jesus, where Peter, James, and John, they go up a mountain with Jesus, and they get to see Jesus in all his glory. All these incidents now leading up to where we're at, Matthew 18, they've been really incredible, incredible stories and almost life-changing moments, almost. But now when we get to Matthew 18, it's all, it seems like it's all been quickly forgotten as if we're now starting to go downhill rather than uphill. So let's go to my first point, Jesus' affection towards little ones. Okay, so I don't, I don't have the iPad here today because of some things, but just imagine I have one. So it's stated here in verse one. What's not stated here in verse one, but that's very important, is according to Mark's version of this story, Mark chapter nine, according to his versions, the disciples are arguing. Okay, that's, that's, that, that's the framework that Mark wants us to have, but I also think, you know, Matthew, you know, assumes as well. And they, they're arguing about what? About who is the greatest in the kingdom? Okay, so let's go deeper. So the terms I would draw your attention to in the passage is this. So if you have a pen, a highlighter to, to underline in your Bibles or a way to do it with your digital device, I would encourage you to highlight the word in verse one of eight, chapter 18, and who is the greatest? And the second part I would I encourage you to highlight is the kingdom of heaven. So why has this become such a heated debate for disciples? Why do we enter that in, into chapter 18? Okay, I believe there are two answers that come to this question. It's not stated here in the passage, but I think Peter, James, and John could not help but share with the other disciples about the transfiguration of Jesus. I want you to imagine that after this transfiguration, the, the disciples and Jesus go back down the hill, they meet with the other disciples, and I can imagine Peter, James, and John telling the other disciples, hey, guess what I saw? Now the other disciples most likely felt what? Left out. Some of the disciples might have thought to themselves, why Peter, James, and John get to see Jesus in all his glory? What about us? What possible reason could Jesus have for the rest of us not to see him? in his glory. Secondly, Jesus, all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, up to, you know, he's gonna mention the term, the kingdom of heaven. Up to this point of chapter 18, he's only mentioned it four times. But after that, for the entirety of the Gospel of Matthew, he's gonna mention it 32 times. So this is, must be important. In our context today, when you and I talk about greatness, we usually measure it in a number of ways, but there's really only one way. In particular sports, think about sports, think about soccer or better known as football. When we talk about players, players like you know, Pele to Maradona to Messi, true football fanatics will debate on what? On numbers, stats. They'll debate also on the eras they played in. They'll maybe debate on even the teammates that they had. True sports fans really get into the debates of who is the greatest, and, and those conversations continue to this day. But the disciples are looking at this issue of greatness a little differently. Because what's interesting is, they're talking about greatness, but not a single one of the disciples, not a single one has any number to back 
them up about their greatness. What are they? Every disciple here is a big fat zero. They got nothing. You know, I can still remember very clearly in when I was in elementary school, during, you know, during lunchtime, when the bell would ring for lunch, all the boys, all the boys would run out to the field to play soccer together. But it usually went like this, every lunchtime. When we get to the field, there will always be like two captains. Okay, the two captains were usually the two best football players. And what would happen is the rest of us, probably about 50 of us, would stand across the two captains. And then the two captains would start to select who would be on their team, each having a go. I always found myself in the last five. And by that point, I'm not kidding you, with no exaggeration, by the time they got to the last five, the two captains gave up on picking. And then they let the last five, you decide which team you wanna play for. So I usually picked the team that I thought was gonna win. You know, at that time I was still very young, but you know, at that time, honestly, it didn't bother me. But now that I know better and I have feelings, oh man, that's embarrassing. But would you look with me in verse two? Chapter 18, in verse two it says, Jesus calling to him a child who put him in the midst of them. So after this question about greatness, look at what is missing in verse two. There's something missing. Jesus does not once tell them to not pursue greatness. He doesn't say that. When you read the rest of the passage, when you put all of that passage together, you're gonna see that Jesus actually, he wants them and he wants us to pursue greatness. He actually does. Don't we all want to be great? I know I wanna be a great husband. I wanna be a great father. Something better than a three out of 10. I want to be great at, at what I do. I want to be a great neighbor. I know I only, not only want it for myself, but I want it for my children. I want my children to be great at school. I want them to be a great child, a great friend, a great Christian. How does Jesus respond to their fight, their arguing over greatness in the kingdom of heaven? He says it right there in verse two. Jesus calls a child, and he has this child sort of stand in front of them. You know what's really interesting about the term child here in the Greek? The term child here, it's not in the masculine and it's not in the feminine. He has no gender role to it. And what's also interesting in regards to child, he also does not name the child. You see, in the days of Jesus, children had no social status. They had no social standing. And they were considered actually one of the lowest in that culture. But he is a child then that stands amongst them. Jesus is making a very big statement here with this very young child. We do not feel the, like the, the tension we do not feel the tension like the disciples do right at this moment. Why? Why don't we feel this tension? Think about in our cultural context today. Um, we, we sort of, we lift up children, we protect our children, we fight for our children, rightfully so, as we should. But in recent times, I've, I've, I've seen that shift. It's, it's slowly, it's changing. I think there's, there's two major shifts in our culture today in regards to children, two major shifts. The two major shifts are this. First, I've seen people, in particular, you know, people who don't have children, I think some people prefer pets over kids. Because they look at a person like me and they think, oh man, having kids seems like a heavy burden. And kids seem a little annoying. You're not wrong. 
I mean, look at me. I'm 15 years old, but look how the children have aged me. <laughs> Secondly, on the other end of the scale, I've seen some parents treat their children like idols. I've witnessed parents love their children more than they even love their spouses. And I've witnessed parents love their children more than they love Jesus. Look, I know for many parents, including my parents, as refugees, you just want to give your children the best. Amen. Or you just want to give your children the things that you never had growing up. But my question is this, at what cost? You know, I remember when I was a child and my parents paid for me to do piano lessons. Surprise, but I played piano for many years. I hated all of it. My parents and I would argue about it all the time growing up. And I would ask them, why do I have to play the piano? And they would always answer, because it's a wonderful instrument and we always wanted to play it growing up. Then I would say then, why don't you play it instead of me? <laughs> and mom and dad always said, because we're too old. And then I would say, then you better get started. <laughs> you know, parents, listen. As a parent myself, it is not wrong to love your children. You are called, you are called to love your children but you will love them best when you love Jesus first. Then your spouse, then them. But anything, anything you love more than Jesus is an idol. A quick thing to point out in verse three. In verse three, you see in the beginning that every time you see Jesus say, truly I say to you, every time in all of scripture, He's actually calling you to listen, to pay attention. He's saying, okay, pay attention to what I'm going to say next. So what, do we sh what should we pay attention to? He's calling us to pay attention to the first two imperatives of verse three. And what are the first two imperatives? The two imperatives are turn and become. The word turn here is better understood in the Greek as sort of convert or converting. He's telling, he's telling those who are listening, hey, don't just stop what you are doing, but then once you stop what you're doing, turn the other way and then walk away from that. Walk in the opposite direction. The second is become. Become like what? Become like a child. So there's a turning and then there's a becoming like a child. The idea behind both words is this. The idea is there is a continuing process. He's saying this is not a one-off event. He's not saying do it once and that's the end of it. No, 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 it's continuing. He's saying for all people who call themselves Christian, this process of turning and becoming, it never ends. Just like a soccer athlete who has bad habits and tendencies in their game, what do they do? They continue to train. They train in order to move away from the bad habits so they can do better. But why is Jesus still pushing this idea of becoming a child? Man, because it seems like Jesus wants us to take this idea of being childlike deeper than you and I actually want to go. I believe the idea that Jesus is making here by referencing children once again within his social context is the idea of humility, which he gets to in verse four. Let me explain of what I think Jesus is going through. Um, I usually go to superstore to go grocery shopping. I'm not gonna tell you which superstore because I don't want you following me. But when I go to Superstore to, to, to buy groceries, you know, on the way there, on the way to Superstore, I always see 
uh, the same homeless guy at the same lights. You know the same guy that holds up the same sign, asking for help in some financial way? If I get past him, and if I don't make any eye contact, I can get to Superstore, I can park my car, but when I get to the front of Superstore, as I'm walking inside the store, there's always two guys, two homeless guys, one on one end each of the entrance of Superstore. Two guys sitting opposite sides of the entrance with a sign asking for money as well. Here's the truth. The truth is I usually do not carry cash with me. But here's the bigger truth. The bigger truth is I just want them to disappear. I hate that awkward moment. I hate looking them in the eye and showing them my empty pockets. I hate that moment when they hear rattling and they think it's coins, I have to prove to them it's not coins at all, it's just my keys. My life would be easier if they weren't there. But Christians and non-Christians alike, nobody wants to be treated this way. I think most of us would agree that there are times when we all need help, do we not? But we would, but we would not want to be mistreated like the homeless people, but we also don't want to be mistreated like the children. But Jesus is actually, if you look at the text, he's going up against every single cell of our bodies and encouraging us not to, don't think too highly of yourself, but don't think too lowly of yourself. He's saying when we get to the place of what place? The place of humility, then we are able to enter. That's weird. I thought the disciples were fighting about who will be the greatest in the kingdom, but now Jesus is talking about entering the kingdom. I think this, uh, the disciples have forgotten, just like you and I can, we've forgotten about the real possibility of not even entering the kingdom, let alone on who's gonna be the greatest. Highlight the word there in verse four when he says, whoever humbles. Jesus wants us to humble ourselves like a child. If you question the, the passage like me, I would ask Jesus in this moment, Jesus, how is a child humble? For those who don't know, I have two young daughters and I do not get the sense that they are humble. Every time they play a game together, it always ends up with them fighting. They're crying and screaming that the one didn't let the other win. Or when they play sports, they wanna beat each other until one cries. Or when you show affection to one child, the other child gets jealous and says, oh, you don't even love me anymore. The word humbles here is best understood in the original language, in the Greek, as it's translated as the lowest position. You know, in the family I was raised in, children were always sort of second class. You know, every time we had families, uh, had dinner with other families, um, there was always a table for adults and there was always a smaller and shorter table for kids, somewhere hidden, somewhere in the house. You know, the kids' table always looked and felt different Thank God I get to punish my children that way as well by putting them on the kids' table. But C.S. Lewis, the former professor of Oxford and Cambridge University and an Anglican theologian once wrote, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Let me repeat that. True humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Church, 
There are many of you in this room right now, or for those who are online, where you have yet to really commit to Jesus, like really commit. Many of you have been following Jesus for a really long time. Many of you have been following Jesus for a very short time. But each and every one of you, God is calling you to something. I think one of those things is, he's calling many of you in this room to be baptized. Many of you do not want to get baptized, I believe, because welcoming welcoming Jesus into your life publicly would mean losing some things you really want to keep. Because you don't want to give those things up. Jesus is calling you, become like a child. I'm so thankful, as is Pastor Jonathan, our life groups pastor. There are many of you in life groups. For those who do not know, if you're visiting, so thankful that you're here. But if you do not know our church, uh, we meet during the week. We gather in small groups, which we call life groups, where we sort of, uh, we meet each, you know, each week we to eat, to pray, to study God's word together. It's actually a really good and healthy thing for the Christian life. But to my brothers and sisters, many, many of you will ask to change groups. Pastor Vin, can I change life groups? You wanna know why? The number one excuse is? Because you do not like the person in your group. Many do not want to be in life groups because they do not, do not want to welcome others in their lives. Or it all feels, being in a life group, all feels, it's just too time consuming. Jesus is calling you, become like a child. Jesus' affection are really on those who see themselves as small, insignificant, unseen, like a child. It is those that Jesus deems as the greatest. A great way to understand this idea is in C.S. Lewis's series, The Chronicles of Narnia, in particular his book, Prince Caspian. In Prince Caspian, there's a section where when Lucy, one of the characters, addresses Aslan. Aslan is the Christ-like figure in the book. And Lucy says to Aslan, Aslan, they haven't seen each other for a while. And Lucy says, Aslan, she says, you're bigger. Aslan, you're bigger, this Christ-like figure. And then Aslan responds, that is because you are older, little one. And then Lucy responds to say, wait, 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 not because you are? And Aslan finally responds with, I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Even now as an adult, I can still remember when I was young, my parents being bigger and stronger And I still love those deep memories of my parents being like that, my heroes. But how much more of Jesus? The more we grow, the more we become like children, the bigger Jesus becomes. To my second point, Jesus' actions towards humanity's greatness. When you look at verses five and six together, that whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones uh, who believe me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. When you look at verses five and six together, you will notice that Jesus starts to change terms. See, Jesus in the beginning was using the term child. Then he switches in verse six. He switches terms and uses Little ones. You see, the context of the entire passage is not actually about children at all. But it's actually more about spiritual children. Those we might consider weak in the faith or who do not have the spiritual maturity to make the godliest and wisest choices. Jesus is saying that we need to love those people, those little ones, and look after them the same way he would. But he says, but if you do the opposite, if we cause these little ones to stumble, to sin, and to slide away from Jesus, Jesus has a very, very harsh reaction. But the disciples' focus is really on the kingdom of heaven. 
Because like any other kingdom on earth, there's a hierarchy. And then in a honor and shame culture that the disciples find themselves in, none of them want to be the least in the kingdom. Why? Because that's shameful. Jesus mentions the millstone here in verse six, near the end of verse six. The millstone that Jesus is talking about is best understood as a donkey millstone. Okay, a donkey millstone. So the donkey millstone would weigh a, a close to a thousand pounds or about 450 kilograms. It was a normal practice within the Roman Empire to tie a millstone around someone's neck and to throw them into the sea as punishment. That's the harsh reaction that Jesus has to men and women, boys and girls, as one of your pastors, I love you. But there's a cost when you send each other photos over the phone that no one should be seeing. You might be causing a little one to sin. To many in Unite, into our college and career ministries, I love you too. But I know there are many of you who are sleeping together outside the context of marriage and somehow you convince yourself that it's totally okay. But you know what's really dangerous? What's really dangerous is if you've convinced the girl who was really unsure, you've convinced her it's okay. You might be causing a little one to sin. Parents, I love you too. Maybe we've told our children one too many times how they are useless with phrases like, what's wrong with you? You might be causing a little one to sin. See, Jesus continues with this warning and these consequences of of not obeying verses seven to nine. He continues Woe to the world for the temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. See, what Jesus is saying here is a continuation of his last point. He says that the world, he's saying in verse seven, first of all, he's saying the world, when you look at the world, the world is already full of sin and temptation. But his warning is not to the world, the warning is to those who assist the world in making little ones sin. That's where his warning is. So the question I have now for us is, what are we to do then in in our cultural moment that we find ourselves in? What are we to do with all the images in the world? You know what images I mean? Those images, all the sexual images in movies, on our phones, on advertisements, it does everywhere that surround us because it seems like a battle we cannot win. Either the Christian response is to somehow completely avoid everything, avoid it all, all sexual images, or according to what Jesus says, he tear out our eyes and just throw it away. I do not believe Jesus is calling Christians to hide under a rock. I don't think that's what's happening here but I do believe Jesus deems us responsible for what we put into our bodies. Just like putting good food into your body will produce good results, and bad food will produce not so good results. I think the essence is that God is saying, feed your souls. Feed it with the word of God, but also, in the context, feed it with God's people. Because God loves his people through his people. There is a community here to love and support even though we are surrounded by all types of temptations. Surround yourself with God's people. There are two images that Jesus gives to his hearers. First, the first image he gives is at the end of verse six. And then the next one, it comes in verses eight and nine. So the words 
sea at the end of verse six or get the imagery of water, a lot of water. And in verses eight and nine is then fire. These are the images, he's giving you this idea of if these things were to consume you, if they, they, they would actually overwhelm you and he's saying there's no escape. That's what he's saying, you would drown or you'd be burnt. You know that stats show us that smartphone use is on the rise at all age levels. It's on the rise ever since the introduction of the iPhone in 2007. And those numbers haven't decreased on all ages, doesn't matter how old you are. And we also know, stats also show us that our smartphones have a direct correlation with our mental health. Okay, so you and I can agree that at least that we know that there are temptations to this, and that as some of, and then we know some of the consequences of these temptations. But I think what we've done is convinced ourselves and many others that, but Vin, our phones and stuff, our screen time, that's just the norm. Get over it. My concern for us is that I do not know what the smartphone will do to our human flourishing. Not just now, but for the years to come. But I am concerned that if we keep moving in this direction, we will end up in some sort of, what I would say, hell-like state. You know, a state where ideas and thoughts divide us, a state where we hardly talk to each other, a state where we find it difficult to have relational human beings. Being overrun by the world and all of its temptation, it's so serious to Jesus. It's so serious to him, he's saying it's a matter of life and death, or in his terms, it's a matter of what? Heaven and hell. Heaven will be the place filled with people who think lowly of themselves. And hell will be the place filled with people who only think of themselves. Let me repeat that. Heaven will be the place filled with people who who think lowly of themselves, and hell will be the place filled with people who only think of themselves. So would you come before Jesus? Would you continuously turn and become like a child, knowing that you have nothing to offer, just like me? We have nothing to offer him, but what? But ourselves. And that's exactly what he wants. So to my third and final point, Jesus' attitude towards godly humility. There are two words I would encourage us to highlight, and they come in verse 10, at the right at the beginning of verse 10, and right at the beginning of verse 12. These terms, I think, are hopeful that Jesus would start to see in verse 10 and verse 12. The word that I would encourage you to highlight is the word see, at the beginning of verse 10, and the word think, in verse 12, I find these terms hopeful because Jesus is calling his followers to be, it's this idea of being action orientated. The term means more than just being a bystander, but rather we are to actively be doing the very opposite of what? What's the opposite? He's telling you, don't. Do not despise the little ones. So do the very opposite of those things. So what's the opposite? He's basically encourage little ones, serve little ones, befriend a little one. Look, look carefully with me at verse 10. Because for I tell you that in heaven the angels will always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. But before that, he said, do not despise the one out of these little ones. Did you see that? Jesus is saying, don't even despise the one out of the little ones. Jesus takes it further with this imagery of a a shepherd with a hundred sheep. Don't look at this story as, you know, sort of losing one, like a sort of like a business transaction that you've lost now 1%, but don't worry, because you have 99% still. No, no, no. Jesus cares. This is is the emphasis of the, the parable of the lost sheep. The emphasis is Jesus cares as much for the one as he does for the 99. Jesus makes his point even clearer when he makes a very weird but controversial comment when he talks about the little ones having angels. 
commentators debate what Jesus really means. Does Jesus mean that um, each little one or each child has like a guardian angel? Um, look, I'll make, two, I'll make two comments. First, I believe, this is the thing that I believe, I believe there are forces of good and evil, forces that I do not see. But this is what I know for sure. The forces of good are better and stronger than the forces of evil. And I already know that Jesus has already won the war and the battle. That's where my confidence is. The second thing I think Jesus, this is what Jesus is referring to in regards to the angels. Um, I don't know if you know the singer, Katy Perry. Katy Perry is an American singer. Um, uh, But she was invited to sing for King Charles's coronation. It was reported that her entourage, her entourage consisted of 50 strong, and that she needed five dressing rooms for her outfits and for her entourage. My question is, if we're walking around with an entourage, what do you think that says to the world I think it says that you're a pretty important person and not just any little one can sort of approach you. What I think is happening here in regards to the reference of the angels is this. I believe that Jesus is referencing the importance, not of the angels, though that's what people wanna focus on. The focus here is the little ones. He's pointed to the fact that the little ones are so important that that they are angels, that's their entourage. Do not only do the things, but he then says in verse 12, but you've got to think about these things deeply. Think about how Jesus, think about how Jesus did not despise them, did not despise us. Think about how Jesus did not forsake them and does not forsake our, our littleness. But what does Jesus do? Instead of forsaking, he, he comes close. More than that, Jesus becomes little himself in order, in order to save little ones. As Jesus has taught us, let us love and serve those who are little because we are little ourselves. And yet Jesus loves and serves us. And let us love and serve little ones and and ourselves away from the world and towards Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm gonna conclude with this, something very short. In the context that Jesus is in, did you know that sheep were considered less than children? Sheep were used as something transactional. Sheep were there for what? For food, for clothes. But it's this great shepherd that we call Jesus who goes after sheep. That's the image that Christ leaves us with. But you want to know what's even lower than a sheep? A lamb. But it's John the Baptist who sees Jesus coming towards him and says in John chapter one, verse 29, when he sees Jesus, the next day he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is Jesus, the Lamb, who humbles himself to where? To the point of what? To the point of death, death where? Death on a cross so that whoever puts their trust in him would join him in his greatness. So will you humble yourself before Jesus in order to do be lifted up by him? Let's pray. So Jesus, we come before you with all the words and the feelings that we can muster up and give you praise and glory, why? Because you were the lamb that was sacrificed. You were the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Lower than a child, lower than sheep, you showed the ultimate humility. So Jesus, for those of us who have tasted and seen your great humility, who know about your sacrificial, the sacrificial lamb, call us. 
to see and to think deeply of how to serve and love and befriend little ones here. And Jesus, for those of us who who have not called ourselves little before you, would you just, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you show us our ways, the the, the honesty of it, you know, to unveil our eyes and to help us see the way the way we deem greatness is actually not great at all. Would you help us to see our reality that we desperately need you? And it's when we when we feel helpless and hopeless and on our knees, that's when you wipe away our tears. You grab our hand and you lift us up off our knees. And you give us meaning, purpose, identity. So Jesus, help. Help each and every one of us to come before you, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remind us that we don't just do that today. But for those those of us who know you, we will do this for all eternity. In your great name and sacrifice, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So there'll be questions up on the screen. And afterwards, you'll be uh, called to come to the front to pray with elders, pastors, life group leaders, not just here on this level, but up as well. to respond and continue in worship, so I invite you to stand and join us. Um, and I invite the elders, pastors, and life group leaders up to the front. If you would like to pray with someone, uh, we invite you to come up to the front and pray with them.
So church, before you go, I'm gonna read from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 to 21, which says, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.